Um, I am Nico and I am a user experience designer at uh, Unity and I've been working on the new prefab workflows that probably like a good amount of you have heard about, if I'm making a guess. Uh, did you guys see the keynote yesterday? Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, so as a user experience designer at Unity, I work on improving the workflows of Unity. And the way that we do that is that we try to include our community as much as possible in the design process. Now, my background is in creative tools. I've done both academic research and some hands-on uh, attempts here at Unity uh, to dig into how you can make uh, interfaces that support creative flow. So that's my background and that's my motivation. And that's also why for me it's been super great to work on the prefab workflows because they're just so fundamental to what we're all working on every day in Unity. So today I'm gonna talk about what we set out to do, what we learned along the way, we got a bit smarter, which is good, and how we ended up actually changing the prefab workflows. Uh, I have a demo to show you, which we built just for this talk, and it's made up of uh, UI. Uh, so it's basically showing you how you can use the new workflows for creating UI in Unity. And I'm gonna end on some tips and resources uh, so that you guys can get started really well uh, with the new workflows. Uh, a little bit of important information, uh, just in case this is not already clear or well known. Uh, the new workflows, including nested prefabs, they are in beta right now, which means that you can actually go and try them out. I'm gonna show you at the end of the talk where to get it, so don't worry. Um, and the release of the new prefab workflows is gonna be 2018.3. So that means it's before December. <laughs> I have one of my I have the lead engineers sitting in the back going like, yes. <laughs> but it's gonna be there. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the project and what we've been working on. So uh, we are this team. Um, so we are the prefab team. <laughs> Yeah, it's a very nice Photoshop by Stine, who is our product manager, where we were like, let's make a funny photo, and we we're holding prefabs, and yeah, we are nerds. Um, so, <laughs> but, and that, but I think that's a really good thing, because everyone on this team care very deeply about uh, improving the user workflows, like how to use Unity, basically, and we are all like prefab enthusiasts, which you can see from the photo. So, um, when we started working on this uh, project about two years ago, um, we actually already had a pretty good idea about a technical prototype for nested prefabs. So that meant that we, we felt that we, we already knew kind of what we needed in terms of the technical stuff. But the things that we were not so sure about were actually what the workflows were going to be like. And the reason for that is, um, so when we went out initially and we started working on this, we both internally at Unity and also talking to the community, we talked, about, we talked to people and we got like a lot of different ideas about this nested prefab stuff, right? So when you ask people, they would typically all have their own interpretation about what that would be. And the one thing that we didn't want to do was we didn't want to go out and just make one idea that we had in our heads about how this should be, and then just assume that that will cover the ground for all of you guys, right? So we actually went through quite an extensive process of involving the community, um, and we spoke to a lot of you, and maybe, I think there are some of the people in the room right, hi Ben, uh, some of the people uh, in the room right now have actually been part of the process. Um, so it's been important for us to represent both small, large productions, we talked to game. Uh, we talked a lot to people who make games. We also talked to automobile, other industries, and along the way, we actually did a number of game jams and user testing where we had people in and they tried the new features and then they built stuff with it. And that was like hugely helpful to us because we can't imagine everything that we need to do in order to support you. We have to actually see you work with the tools to be able to make sure that the workflows are just right. 
And we know that we still have work to do. So by the way, when you're using the beta and when you use the first release, it's very important for us to, I know we say this every talk, right? But <laughs> to get the feedback back to us so we can keep improving because we really do care very, very deeply about it. So when we started working on the project, the first thing we did was we went out and we spoke to you and we asked this question. What are the problems that you have when you're working with prefabs? So the reason that product people and designer people, we are always asking about problems is because we're trying to get behind the feature request, we're trying to get behind and figure out when you say you would like something, what is actually the thing you want to solve. And what we learned was that, well, one thing is, and I think this is quite obvious maybe to everyone, is that the current workflows just didn't scale, right? They weren't scalable for big productions. They needed to be more, uh, needed to have more power. We also found very interestingly that a lot of people reported, and this were like big studios, small studios, saying, you guys, you're losing hours and hours of work because you make mistakes when you're using the prefab system. Now, you might just say, okay, then we need to do more documentation and training around what it means to press apply and blah, blah, blah. But we actually approached it a bit the other way, and we said it's our responsibility to try to make the tools safe for you to work with, as safe as possible, and to show you what you're actually affecting when you're making a change. So this is something that we cared very much about and that we've invested a lot of time in. We knew that we needed to make prefabs scale. We knew, we knew that we needed to make it easier to iterate when you're working on prefabs. And we knew that we needed to solve the collaboration problems that come from just having one huge prefab and then you are all fighting about who gets to check it out and actually work on it. We also learned while talking to you that visual variations are very important, right? So when we're creating big, rich worlds, what we really want to do is we want to be able to reuse stuff but still make those variations so it doesn't look stale and boring. So this was the, these were the takeaways, again, from those like that long process of talking to a lot of uh, people in the community. So what we came up with were three principles. I'm a designer, so I like design principles. Uh, first is safe editing. So being able to safely edit something and not like accidentally make a lot of changes you didn't intend. Second is visibility, and it ties in very well with the first, which is you need to be able to understand what is the context of what you're doing. Like what, if I'm doing this, what will the consequences be? And then thirdly, productivity, right? And I think that's the one that is maybe the most clear uh, when you look at nested prefabs, that we're just gonna you know, be able to be more productive when we are working in Unity. So um, is there anyone here who's not, uh, who's new to Unity? Okay, yeah. Um, is there anyone here who doesn't uh, use prefabs very often? Okay, oh, all right. So for just to get everyone along and also because we will have people watching this online, I'm gonna talk a little bit about prefabs and what they are. So um, a, pre a prefab is a reusable building block and the idea with it is that you can make any kind of object in Unity into a prefab. This is not, oh, here we go. Um, and then what you can actually do is you can take that object and you can place that anywhere in your game. So we can imagine we have a character and we want to reuse that character. So we place instances of that prefab file everywhere in the game. Now, what's the big idea? Well, the big idea is that when we then get our art director coming to us and saying, oh, we need to change the haircut, needs to be different, needs to be like this, then I, as a tech artist, I don't have to go and change all of those unique uh, character objects. I can just change the file and all of these changes will update. So that's pretty nice. Um, so in the Mega City demo yesterday, we saw that this has like potential to be very, very scalable, especially when you add nested prefabs to the equation. Um, so the idea of nesting prefabs basically means to take a prefab and then place it inside another prefab. And if you're familiar with flash workflows, 
It's a bit like taking one movie clip and nesting that inside another movie clip. So I have a movie clip of a butterfly that I nest in the field, that I nest in the landscape, that I nest in the world, right? And then if I update either of those, the whole thing just works. So it's kind of, you know, for me, when I was working with like Unity 4 back in the day, I remember like trying to nest a prefab inside another prefab and thinking, apply and then nothing and it didn't work and why not? So I think, you know, it's a way of thinking about templates where it's kind of intuitive that you should just be able to put them inside each other. Uh, okay, so if you're interested in knowing more about how they built this mega city demo uh, using nested prefabs, uh, I encourage you to go to Martin's talk. So Martin is one of our coworkers who worked on the demo, and he can tell you all about how you can pick apart that uh, demo and look at all the nested stuff. Really, really cool. Um, so. Back to what I was talking about before, that we actually went out and we found that there's more than just nested prefabs that we needed to do. So we've introduced these four new feature areas, and I'm going to show you how to work with all of them in just a moment in the editor. The first one is a prefab mode. It ties back to safe editing. So the idea is to create a safe space in which you can edit a prefab and where you're not like uh, accidentally saving changes that you have in your scene. The second is nesting. And again, we knew that we needed to create nesting. The things that we needed to figure out were actually what were the right workflows. Because when you add nesting, you actually add a lot of complexity to the system. Then the third thing is very interesting. It's something that came out of working with the prefab uh, workflows. It's the idea that we can take one prefab and then we can actually make a variant of that prefab and then also use that as a prefab file. I'm going to show you how that works for UI in just a bit. Finally, we've gone through and we actually imp improved the apply system quite a lot. So there's a lot of new functionality there. It's going to make it very simple, well, simple, make it simpler for you uh, to choose what you want to apply or revert. revert what you want to apply to, and just generally just have more information so you better have a better overview of what you're doing when you're saving your changes. So, but I've talked for a bit now, so I think I'll just uh, go and uh, do the demo now. Great. Um, yeah, all right. So, um, we've created this uh, UI demo, uh, me and one of our field uh, evangelists. Um, and um, I'm just going to play it for you so you can actually see how this looks. So it's uh, like simulating that we've paused the game, right? And we can, we can select some different ways of playing our game that I call like player profiles, right? Because right now I'm playing as an adventurer and I can see, oh, okay, I have some special skills, some stuff I can do if I'm an ad adventurer. And I'm going to go and actually select the rogue profile because that fits my style better. Um, so this is like a pretty simple uh, UI, but it's reusing a lot of things. And uh, the cards, as we call them, like the profiles that I'm switching around, they are actually prefab variants. Uh, the whole UI is made up of nested prefabs. So we're reusing all of the headers, for example. That's all of the text that's like in caps. It's actually uh, the same prefab that's being reused and nested uh, all over the scene. So let's have a look and see actually how that looks. So here we have uh, Unity. And if I just play again, you can see that we actually have this uh, roundabout set up, so it's moving around in 3D, and that's basically how we're switching out these cards. So if we go to 2D and I move over here a little bit, I've actually gone and like, laid out all of the UI uh, objects so you can see what it is that I'm actually talking about. <laughs> um, so very first thing I want to do is just go in and have a look at this prefab. So this prefab is the base prefab that all the prefab variants are inheriting from. I'm going to show you in a bit how to actually set that up, but let's just make a mental note that that's the case. Um, so if I go in and look at that, I can see that 
it's actually one prefab that's made up of multiple nested prefabs. Yay! <laughs> this is you know this is so wild for me, you guys. Like it's like ten years ago, I was like, why can't I nest things? And now I'm just building this demo. Like, yeah, it works. It's fine. It's it's a, it's great. I'm happy. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, so um, what was I saying? Card template is pre yes okay. So um, the first thing you might notice is that we've introduced icons into the hierarchy. The reason we've done that is so you can differentiate between a game object and a prefab because it's become more important now that you can actually add prefabs to prefabs and create nested structures. So when you see the blue icon, that means it's a prefab and it's a prefab in its own right, like it's a prefab root. If you see a gray icon, it means that it's a game object. So any object in your game uh, is basically a game object, right? Now, if you want to see if a game object is part of a prefab or not, you can look at the text, because if it has a blue text, it's part of a prefab. If you look down here, if it has like a gray text, it's, part, it's not part of a prefab, it's just a game object on its own. All right, so let's look at how the card template is built up. So in this template, I've basically put all the things that all the cards need, right? So these are all the things that are be, gonna be common to all the cards in the game. I've got this header text that's a nested prefab and that I'm also reusing for other stuff. I've got this paragraph text and I've got this metal template, which is, it's like all the circles and stuff that's, uh, and, par and particle effects and things that are moving whenever I'm playing the game. The metal template is actually also full of nested prefabs. So you can see how this can extend all the way down. Um, so let's maybe just go and nest the prefab. Like maybe that would be like a good place to start. So let's say that I actually have this uh, skill counter prefab that I want to be part of all my cards. So what I'm gonna do is I'm dragging that from the project onto the hierarchy, onto the card template. And you're gonna see two things. You saw that it was added and you can see that there's this small <laughs> plus icon next to it. Now what this means is at this point, we've basically just parented our prefab to a prefab, right? Because there are many cases where you want to do that in your scene, you just want to parent objects together so they follow each other around or you know, for rendering or whatever you want to do. So if I actually want to make that prefab part of the card template, one of the ways I can do that is I can go in, I can right click, I can say edit game object and I can say apply to prefab card template. So oh, I'm actually also just gonna move it down so it looks a bit better, here we go. And of course I also need to apply the position because now I moved the position. All right, so what we can see then is that if we play our game that now we have this skill counter and it's been added to all of the uh, prefabs here. So that's basically how you would go in and nest the prefab. It's like drag it onto something, press apply, here you go. It seems kind of straightforward, right? <laughs> but the most of the work that we did was actually regarding how to visualize for you how you could save your changes to different nested prefabs. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. The next thing that I would like to talk about is uh, prefab mode. Because as I said initially, we worked a lot with this idea that we need a safe space for editing. So one way to enter prefab mode, let's say I want to go into card template and I want to edit that prefab, is that I go here and I find this little arrow and I click that and now some things happened here, right? We have the blue background, which is different. And if you look over here in your hierarchy, we don't actually see all the contents of the scene anymore. We're only seeing the contents of the prefab. Now, when you're working in this mode, you don't have an apply button on the top root prefab because you're not applying changes to an asset, you're actually editing the prefab asset. Does that make sense, right? So it's kind of a direct edit mode for the prefab that you opened. And then now I can also go and actually uh, move this thing that I put 
in the wrong place, so that's good. <laughs> um, all right, so a few things about the prefab mode. Uh, it comes in uh, by default with autosave toggled on. So there's this little toggle up here which says autosave. And what that means is if I move something around, I'm going to move stuff, and you guys, you're going to look down in the game view, right? So you can see st stuff moving around, right? Can you see it? Yeah, okay, good. Just checking. So that's because I have autosave on. And what that means is every time I make a change, we're basically auto-saving that to the asset and then re-importing all the files. Now, that might not necessarily be what you always want. Like, for if you have very big projects, like the Mega City demo, huge demo, right? Then you can go and actually turn off auto-save if you're having some, if you, if you have some wait time whenever you're saving. Turning off auto-save has another benefit. It basically turns the prefab mode into an editing space where I can just do whatever I want, right? Because I might want to open up a prefab and just kind of play around with it. So I can now go and I'm moving stuff and I'm changing things and I'm saying, okay, maybe, you know, this would be a better layout and like, okay, I'm not really an artist and this is very bad. So once I've got autosave turned on, if I then go back to the scenes, Unity is actually going to ask me, hey, you changed this file. Do you want to save your changes? And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> that, was not, that wasn't good. I'm not saving that. All right, so that's basically the idea of prefab mode. Go in, you make changes. You can do it live updating, or you can do it like, in a kind of a safe space that also can help if you have performance problems. Let's go back into the card template. And the card template, again, it's full of nested prefabs. And I can actually, from this point, dig in further, right? Because we're thinking about prefabs being nested. It's kind of a structure where you have the outermost, you have a bunch of middle ones, and you have innermost, right? It's like a babushka doll, right? <laughs> Big, small, small, small. Um, and that is also represented here by the fact that we can see the hierarchy. And I can actually go and dig in one level and say, hmm, maybe I just want to have a look at the header text. Because as I said before, the header text is actually nested inside my scene in all different kinds of locations. So if I go in and I look at the header text, now what I've actually done is I've dug in and now I'm looking at the header text prefab. Now, I'm not looking at it in the context of the card template. I'm not looking at it in the context of the scene. I'm just making changes here to the header text prefab itself. Now, if you ever get lost and you want to go back out, you can use the breadcrumb up here. It's, uh, I recommend it. It's useful. So let's make some sort of visual change that we can actually see. So let's make the text red and turn autosave back on. So if you maybe will just play so we can actually see what we're doing. Yeah, here we go. So you saw that I went in and I changed the header text prefabs, and now all of the header text prefabs have updated in our scene. They're all nested, right? The info panel down there is a huge prefab with lots of stuff, the menu up there as well. So this is, again, this is going to save you some time. And the reason it saves time is, go back in, the reason it takes time is, that, you know, I might want to try out all sorts of, you know, visual, like right now I'm just changing the font and I'm going like, this is too light, this is maybe not great. And it's just, it's very nice to be able to do that iteration kind of quickly and see that update everywhere. So I can recommend that as a workflow. I think I'm gonna go with Helvetica just because I'm old fashioned that way. And <laughs> nice, there are other fun people in the room, yeah. <laughs> I'm not the only one. Um, okay, and I'm gonna set it back to white because the red was kind of annoying me. Okay, so that was nesting, that was prefab mode. Now the next thing I wanna talk about is prefab variants. Because as I kind of hinted of, uh, at before, we have this new concept where you can have a prefab and then you can actually make a variant of that and let's have a look at how that actually works. So I've laid it out in a way that I hope is intuitive to understand. So as I said before, this card template is actually the base for all the variants. 
And I can see that if I go in and I select a variant, and I said, uh, this one is like the rogue variant, the one that I like. Um, so there's a few things I can see. There's a different icon, and maybe I'm just gonna show you the icon here. This is the variant icon. <laughs> um, all right, that was a bad idea. Now I need to get back. Um, so, rogue, here we go. So if I wanna see this variant where it's inheriting from, I press select, and then it pings the projects. And then in the header here, I can actually see that it says base card template. Now what that tells me is this, this variant, it's gonna inherit all properties from this prefab that's called card template. Cool. Now, how, do, how did I actually set that up? Like how did I arrive at this point? Well, we can try to make a new one. So if I go to the card template, again, the one that all the other ones are based on, I right click, maybe, yeah. I right click and then I say prefab variant. Create prefab variant. There's a lot of stuff in this menu, but it's there. So I create a prefab variant, and I'm going to create, what kind of profile should we make? Should we make a healer profile? Should we make a wizard? Any wizards in the room? Wizard, okay, we'll make a wizard. Ah, I thought you guys were gonna say healer. Ah, okay, uh, so we'll make it uh, a wizard variant. Cool. Um, now I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna drop that in my scene, da 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 da. Here we go. And you see that it comes in looking exactly like the first one, right? Completely like the first one. You got everything inside it that the first one has. Now I'll go in and I'll make a change to it so we can actually see the difference. Uh, wizard. Yeah, make Text different. I am very wise. Cool. Uh, so now we, <laughs> so in order to actually make that uh, part of the asset, I need to apply that. Uh, so I'm gonna go and apply my text change to card wizard variant. You see we have some more options here and we're gonna get to that in a moment, but right now just stay with me card wizard variant, and I'm gonna also apply this one, card wizard variant. Now, that's pretty cool. Now we have a wizard card, and I'm gonna put it down here with the other ones. Now, what's the big idea here? The big idea is, say that I have all my functionality or all the important stuff on the first one, and then I actually, maybe I have a thousand cards in my game. Yeah. So I get to the point where I realize, oh, I need to actually make a change to everything. How do I do that? Well, what I can do is I can go in and I can actually just make my change to the base. Again, that's what we call the, the prefab that the other things are inheriting from. It's called a base. So I make a change. I apply that to card template and you see that we get that change on all the other cards. Now, these other cards, they're not instances of the first card, right? They are, they are files in their own right. And we could actually make a variant of a variant. So I can go in and I can turn on, I've made a mean rogue. So if you feel like playing meaner, you can play this one. Um, so what I'm showing you here is that you've got your base, then you have kind of one level of variance, and then from that level of variance, you can then derive another variant. What that means is, say I wanted both the rogue and the mean rogue to have one particular change, maybe they need some attributes. In this case, I'm just gonna do something visual so we can see it very easily. So I've got this profile icon image, I'm gonna apply that to the variant, and then you see that the other one inherits from that. But the card template didn't get the change, and all the other cards didn't get the change either. So this is a way for you to build up visual variations in your UI, or by the way, everything I'm saying here, I'm using UI to demo, but it, it works for just about any object in Unity, right? 
because it's a prefab system, so it's agnostic to what kind of object you're making. But I think the UI is just a very good case for some of these things. All right. Um, so one more thing that I wanted to talk about is the changes that we have made to the apply system, right? Because I said initially, we're going to talk about prefab mode, we're going to talk about nesting, we're going to talk about variants, and we're going to talk about apply. Now, the problems we've, we heard from you when we went out and spoke to you is, like, we like the prefab system, but we have problems, and we have to, we often waste thousands of hours just having to go and clean up stuff. And one thing that happened a lot to people was, say I've got this card and I put it in my game and I make it red, because in this case I just want it to be red, cool. And then my coworker Ben comes over and he's like, oh, I need to make this, uh, you know, I need to put this audio source here, and then he presses apply. What happens then, right? All the cards in the game are now red, and uh, I go in and I yell at Ben, and we have a fight, and it's not good. So you could say this is a human error. Um, maybe it is. Um, but I actually think that this is a system problem, because it's because it's not visible to us that there are more than one change on the prefab, right? So that's why this kind of problem occurs. So one thing we have introduced is, again, if I go and I just look at, ooh, ha, ha, yay, I'm gonna fix that zooming at some point. Um, so if you just go and look at the card template, right? Um, up here, there used to be a button that just said apply, which was kind of okay, but then had this problem that I'm talking about. But as soon as we introduced nested prefabs, we had a lot of issues, right? For, from the very first user tests we ran, people were just so confused, right? Because if I select the top one, but I have 15 other prefabs inside it, and I press apply, where do my changes go? Like, remember before when I applied the change to the header prefab and everything changed? That's a good case. But maybe I just wanted the header prefab to be red in the context of this card. Maybe I didn't want it to be red for everywhere in my game and everybody's mad at me again. So we've actually gone and done like quite a lot of exploration here. So if you, in your uh, hierarchy, if you're selecting like your top level prefab, your root, you can see that there's now this overrides menu. And the overrides menu uh, actually gives you a list of all the modifications that are made, that have been made to this whole stack, right? So it's ordered by objects, where you have the root objects, you have all of the nested prefabs, like everything that has a modification shows up in this list. Now, if I go in and I just make another change to the header text, bear with me, it's just very visual and easy to do, um, and then I go and I select the root, I can now see this comparison view, right? So my change turned up here under header text, text, and then under the component name. And, I've, and I just clicked it to see like this comparison view. And I can see what's the state of the asset, like what was there before. And I can see what are the changes that I've actually gone and introduced. Now this is really nice because it gives you a chance when you're actually making changes and you wanna like, okay, so what should I save? You can go in and actually like explore a little bit and say what has been changed, what does it look like, and go compare that a bit. Now let's say I actually wanted to apply that change. Well, we have uh, both an apply button here that applies all the changes to the components. And you also have a contextual apply where if you right click on just one property, you can apply to the stack, right? You can choose where you basically want to apply it. And here I have the same, I have the same options. I can, I can choose, do I want to apply this to the header text, which means that all my headers in my game are gonna be red? No. Do I want to apply that to card template, which means that all my cards that derive from, so all the variants of this card, will be red? Yeah, maybe, that, let's try that. So I'll go and I'll apply that, and we get this really funky look now. Uh, so this looks awesome, by the way. I'm so happy that I'm the one doing this demo. Um, so 
this basically gives you some more control. Now, if you then go and look at the nested prefabs here, you see that the other ones, they don't have the overrides button. Why don't they have the overrides button? They don't have it because if you put it on every level, it becomes a little bit unclear what's actually going on. Because when you put a prefab in the scene, we load in that prefab and all of the nested prefabs inside it. And then when you're making changes there, they are made in the context of that topmost prefab, right? But then if I had the apply button on all the levels, I could easily be quite confused. Like, at least this is what we saw in user tests, so I guess you just have to believe me. Or give me feedback that I'm wrong, because I'll be happy to hear it. So may maybe not happy, but you know, you know what I mean. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. So what does that mean? Does that mean we can't apply changes that are like made on the other ones? No, of course you can. Because you have, uh, I'll just find something with a change here. You have a contextual apply on all nested prefabs. So I'll go in and I can right click one property and then I can actually take that one property and just choose where I want to push that. Like, do I want it to go here? Do I want it to go there? So you have all the functionality. It's just that it was a little bit unsafe for, for people to have that big, very tempting apply button right in the middle of every prefab. It just led to a lot of people accidentally clicking things, such as me when I was trying to use the system when we first made it. I was like, what is going on? So, uh, yes. Now, the final thing I would like to show you is, um, so whenever you go into prefab mode, I'll just do that quickly. I'll go into prefab mode of this, which is like the metal template thing. Now, when you're in prefab mode, what we actually do is we keep your scenes loaded. So we're not offloading any of your scenes, but we, look, we have a concept which is we call a stage. So you have a main stage and then another stage. Um, so we keep your scenes in the first stage and then we are actually loading in a new scene that we put your prefab in so you can edit it. Now by default it comes in like this. It's got a blue background. It's kind of weird. <laughs> um, it has, well, it's, it's so you can see clearly, oh, I'm in prefab mode, right? Um, for, uh, we do some special things. So for example, for UI elements, we create a canvas for you because otherwise it wouldn't render. And so we kind of try to make sure that whatever you open, you can see it. Uh, when you discover things that you open that you can't see, please let us know because that's not what we want to do. Um, but what you can actually do is you can create your own scene. So if you want maybe to have a special background, like you are making like a super cool endless runner game and you wanna have like the background of that behind every prefab that you open, cool. I'm gonna show you where you can do that. So we've got file, no, oh, unity preferences, and no, that's not right. Edit settings. And then under editor, we now have a new thing here that's prefab editing environments. So we both have a slot for your regular environment, which is just any prefab. And then we have a special one for UI. And that's because UI requires a canvas. So if you were opening up a regular prefab in a canvas, some, some weird stuff going on there. Um, so you have those two options. And then what you can actually do is you can create any scene in Unity with all your contents and stuff, and then you can just link it there. And then whenever you open up a UI prefab, it will just get put in the, you know, by its transform position right there. So that's a way for you to actually customize your editing environment a little bit. We are very curious if this is helpful. We already have some feedback about, great, I see nodding, great. <laughs> we already have some feedback that people would like to be able to set this per prefab, maybe per project, maybe per, like, you know, so it's kind of like trying to figure out what the right level here is of like customization. So please like keep giving us that good feedback as you try it. Okay, I've got four minutes, so I think I will wrap up, even though I would like to stay all day. Um, <laughs> nested prefabs are now a thing. <laughs> um, you can edit prefabs in the scene view and in, pre in prefab mode. So it's important to know for everyone, we're not removing functionality, right? You can still edit prefabs the same way that you normally would. We're just adding this prefab mode to give you more control. Um, when you're working in prefab mode, if you are uh, experiencing that it takes a long time, 
to save changes and stuff, turn off autosave, that's really helpful. Um, or if you just want to experiment, also turn that off. And prefab variants are pretty cool, and I can't wait to see what people are going to make with them. Um, for the apply button, it has turned into the overrides drop down, and then it's been replaced by all of this contextual apply stuff that I was showing. Of course, there's much more to that, so uh, again, feedback would be nice, but as you explore the system, I hope that will start to make sense to you and become just a new normal. Um, we can apply to different apply, apply targets. As I said, you know, we look at the stack, we choose where we want the change to go, all that good stuff. And you can now right-click any modification, or override as we call them, and revert apply, which also gives you more functionality, right? Because it used to be just, do I apply this or do I revert this? And then I have to choose, you know, do I want all these changes, none of these changes? Eh, not so good. So, uh, resources. This UI project that I showed you today is available online right now. So if you go there, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can try it. Uh, it works with the latest uh, beta. And um, you can pick everything apart. There are more examples in there. I've set up more things, more panels, more stuff. There are also particles that now work with UI. Right? How awesome is that? So there's an example of that, yes. <laughs> I know I didn't do it, but um, I, I didn't make it, but, um, but yeah, but I put it, uh, we put it together so you have that to look at as well, because I think that's awesome. Um, so go in and play around with it, and again, let us know what you think. Um, and then, if I have the time, maybe I do, oh, I need to go to this computer then. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, Unity3D.com slash prefabs. Ah, what did I do? So we have a landing page. It's a prefab workflow improvements landing page. It's just unity3d.com slash prefabs. Um, you can get lots of useful information, videos, how to get started. Um, there is a link down here to the beta everyone. <laughs> the more we try the tools initially, the better they, they are when they come out, right? There's uh, huh, interviews. I don't like those. And uh, if you go to the bottom, uh, there are more sample projects. So we also have 3D uh, sample projects. There's an awesome one by Anti-Touch, which is made of like some robots that run around, and they're all like variants, and it's all very cool. Um, and we also have the uh, demo that I actually showed in uh, Berlin, which is the one with all the foliage and plants and stuff. If any of you saw it, I don't know if you saw it. Um, yeah, that's actually it for me. Um, and I'm almost on time. I'll be outside for questions, I think. I don't think we have time for questions. So thank you for listening.